you bring people that have an idea of how the business works and then, but they have to unlearn it at the real, real, if they bring those skills without changing them about 30 to 40% and being open to new ways, they will fail. And because they're not, they're, they're traditional thinkers, but they're not creative problem solvers. And the real world doesn't create any products. We take in products, you know, eight, 700, 800,000 products a month, process those products. And it's a different way of thinking. Hi, everyone. It's Rob Ocasio. In today's episode of Over the Wall, we had Julie Wainwright. Uh, amazing. She's the uh, founder of The Real Real, uh, was also a dot comer like myself. And I think what's amazing about what she spoke about is really her childhood. And I asked her, you know, what prepared her for some of the challenges she had? Like the, during the COVID, Real Real had to shut down. And, uh, people weren't selling clothing and consigning. She talked about her childhood, some of the challenges that she went through, were, which were extraordinary, and then how later in her life, she turned those into a foundational element to being the person she is. She's actually just leaving her company and now doing something new. And I just think, what a phenomenal person. What an entrepreneur. Uh, what a beacon of hope uh, about getting through adversity and change. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. One of the best I've ever done and uh, enjoy it. Hi, everyone. It's Rob Ocasio, and this is another episode of Over the Wall. Today, we have Julie Wainwright, who's just an amazing entrepreneur. I've been looking forward to this interview. Um, we'll get into all the companies she started, but recently she was uh, the founder of The Real Real, and, uh, and then she went all the way back to the dot-com. As you know, I started live person the dot-com, so we have an affinity uh, from that past. And so, Julie, thank you for being on the show. Oh, I really am excited to do this. I've been listening to you, and you go deep, so I'm thrilled that you asked me. So, um, I guess I want to start recent. Sometimes we start at the beginning, but you just left uh, the real, real. And maybe, you know, you can talk about that experience and, uh, you know, we, you know, you found it. Maybe get a little background for people who don't know about it. Sure. And we can just start there and we'll, we'll work from there. So I founded the company in, um, I think technically it was March of 2011. And we started shipping our first products in 2000, I think it was June of 2011. So shortly thereafter. And I started just with seed financing. It took me, I waited a year before I raised my series A. And during that time, the company, the first year we were 10 million in GMB. It went 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, 250, 500, uh, a billion, and then COVID hit. Um, and uh, COVID knocked the company back quite a bit because we couldn't pick up product because we don't, it's not a self-posting site. The Real Real is an authenticated luxury business. We created a whole new category. And in doing that, um, we provided a lot of services. So for the consigner, we'll come to your home. We'll help you figure out what will sell well, because we don't take everything. Yeah, you, and it's clothing. It's women's clothing. It's expensive. You'll just take it. And well, it's, well, it's women's clothing, men's clothing. It's clothing, right. Um, yeah, so it's, it's Shoes, everything. Clothing, yeah. Handbags. Yeah, it's goods, accessories, everything. It's yeah. home goods, art. Yeah, so it basically is things of value. So when you think of um, the high-end fashion brands from Gucci to Hermes to Chanel, to um, the mid-tier, but still important, Altazura. So high, high-end fashion across all lines, home goods, art. Um, and, you know, we help create a liquidity for those goods. Before that, it was in the brick-and-mortar market. And in doing that, um, it's actually changed the culture and the way people shop, which is a great because instead of necessarily buying things that have no resale value, people are cognizant. And I think most importantly, the Real Rail has really pointed out the value of recirculating goods on the planet, the carbon that you save, the carbon offsets, the water you save. And um, that's the positive side. And the downside, we've, which we've also pointed out, is that 
as we're speaking here, every 10 seconds, a truckload of fashion goes into a landfill in the U.S., and it does not break down easily, and it's a significant problem, mostly led by fast fashion, but, um, but and mostly fast fashion is the biggest offender, but beyond that, um, in general, fashion ends up in the landfill. So we're sort of, the world's become a throwaway na- nation, and it's a serious, serious problem. So by recirculating goods that have value, it actually, it's, a, it's better for the planet. It's better for people who buy those goods because they have a residual value. And for the consumer, we authenticate everything. So every item is authenticated. So we stand behind the goods that we have authenticated them. And that was also new when we did it. So we sort of not only did the real world create a new sector in the luxury consignment, we were the first to authenticate goods and say it's important that fakes keep off the market. We were the first to talk about and quantify, and the only one quantifying the impact of recirculating goods on the planet. And um, for the consigner, we come to your home and we do all the work. So we were also the first full service. So when you put that all together, it's resulted in a unique offering that um, that men and women have really embraced. Um, con- COVID was hard on the business, but they're back and uh, it's good. They're in good shape now. So COVID hits, obviously people are not going to let you in the home and that's, and then, right. So your supply dries up and that's pretty instant. When you think about, I think for you, it's like March hits of 2020, the world is going into lockdown. What's it like? You're, you're CEO founder. You're in, you all of a sudden, a matter of, of, it's probably days that you start to realize my world is changing, right? The so, world of so, so here's the interesting thing. And I think this is plain to one of my strengths. I was listening to the politicians and when you talk, they were talking about a two week shutdown, but if you really listen to them, they didn't know what the heck they were talking about. They had no idea. If you really parse their words, I'm like, wow, we're really in trouble here because they're not making sense. And if they're not making sense and they're operating out of fear, then this is not going to go on two weeks. This is a bigger issue. And everything they said was almost nonsensical when you when you parse it out, if you go back and listen to them. Uh, and, and it didn't matter what state you were in, in New York or California, although California was particularly egregious in the lockdown. So all of a sudden, literally when we got the notice that we'd be have to shut down, I think it was something like March 15th or something. It could have been March 12th. What I did is I called my executive team together and we laid up, up, we put together a plan for how we were going to furlough employees, how we're going to lay off employees, um, what we, we um, had a meeting to see uh, and tried to get with the officials in New Jersey to see if they were going to have a complete shutdown for the app centers. They didn't. And they promised us they wouldn't. California was having a complete shutdown. So, um, and then, so we did that and that happened within two weeks. So by, if the two weeks was extended, because everyone had a two week, we're going to kill this virus or whatever it was. And, um, which made no sense. But once that, once we were notified, it was going to be continued. The, the furlough happened the next day and the layoff happened the next day. So we prepared in that way. And then, um, and then honestly, it was sort of a, horrible battle with the state like the city of Brisbane and California just to get people's product, get returns processed, get product shipped to New Jersey where we could still process product, Um, battles with the local officials, the police. They wanted to lock the thing. You know, it was 20 at that time. It was 250,000 square feet. We had three people in there. So that was that was a nightmare. Um, now, how many, and, and let's say March 1st, how many total employees do you have at that point? I think point we had about 2,100, and we laid off or furloughed about, I, I, I would say by the time it was all done, about 550 immediately. And we had to shut the stores down. And when you shut the stores down, then we had to board them up because of potential looting. So you've got the store shut down. You can't get product. We can't go to people's homes. Florida was the, there were exceptions, Florida and Arizona and a few other, but they weren't the big states for the company. Um, New Jersey, we were still keeping our processing center going. And the interesting thing is um, around March 15th, demand fell way off. 
just, you know, it went from growing 35% to um, actually shrinking considerably. So we ended up having, I think by the time the first half was over, we had an 85 point swing in our business, meaning we went from growing 35% to shrinking 50%. In the meantime, we negotiating with local officials, um, short sellers, or maybe uh, brands that didn't like us were calling, bombarding the mayor of Perth Amboy, saying that we're abusing our employees in our op center. And when I talked to her and they were like, we have to shut you down here too, because uh, you're putting the employees at risk. By that time, we already had masks, we had gloves, we were already disinfecting. And I said, really? So are those phone calls out of state? Or are they in state? Are they from the employees? Would you like to tour the facility? Turns out they weren't in state. And so we were been bombarded either by short sellers or, um, like I said, there's some brands that hate the real rail. I don't know if well we'll know the origin. So we had that going. We had to furlough the employees, move them to shifts, and uh, or and try to move them to fir- shifts in Perth Amboy. We then started there were a lot of people that had an overflow of product that I would say by June, they couldn't get products on the shelf. So the, you know, the brands couldn't, they went to some secondary sellers. So we had to buy product because what happened in May demand came back and it came back in a different way. It came back in a high value, more handbags and fine jewelry. So the real world prides itself on, selling things quickly, knowing how to price them optimally within a hundred days. And the reason that's important, you don't give us, when people give us their things, they don't give us their things to warehouse them. They give us their things to sell them. Consequently, we use a lot of AI and machine learning to set the optimal price within that window. So you get 90% of the product um, sold, sold through, which means by May, our, our take was, we were in trouble. So let me, let's, let's go. I think this is a great story. And let's say crisis management, let's say, because a lot of people don't move fast. Like we grew up to the dot com. You had the pets.com experience. I, I, you know, I had to lay off 140 out of 180 people in 2001 to stay alive. So we lived right. It went from like, and we didn't <laughs> down to 40, wow. right. It was 80% of the, in one day. And, and we lived with a public company. 40 people. It was like pretty crazy, but we learned from these experiences. So I, I want to talk about this. You go home at night because now it all seems real logical. <clears throat> Excuse me. It seems all real logical, but you go home at night on those first couple of days and what happens? Go home, probably going home late or you're at home right now. Exactly. You're at home because you're, you're in COVID lockdown, but what's going through the mind as you try to go to bed? Oh, and how do you how do you continue <laughs> forward? How do you, right? Let's start there, and then I'll ask you. But you don't go to bed going. You know what? I got a plan. Works great. We're gonna furlough seven hundred five hundred people. We're gonna do this. We're gonna talk to like what's what's bedtime like? No, I you know? no, I knew we needed a plan to furlough, so that was all set up. I think it was interesting trying to convince the execs we needed that plan, and you know that like I. There, I had complete certainty I was listening to the politicians correctly and this, and that we would know in two weeks it was going to go on and we couldn't carry all those people. We just couldn't do it. And it wouldn't make sense. So that I was, so it was more convincing my exec team I was writing that. So I was good on that. I didn't anticipate all the, um, the interactions with the sheriffs and the mayors and the, you know, the cities. Um, and I would say, you know, you're really in firefighting mode. So I'm not sure, you know, you know what your ultimate mission is, which is to keep the business alive. So that's your ultimate mission. And you also, you know, I'm a reasonable person. So you want to be reasonable when you're talking to these people who, by the way, weren't reasonable. And so I would say uh, your nights are long and uh, it's not like you're it's not like you're thinking next steps because after we took those steps, just stuff happened that was unpredictable. So then it was, so what happened was then we instituted, I think we were meeting at the beginning three times a day, morning, lunch, and end of day to check in to say, okay, beyond, is there any other things we need? Any other dramas we can anticipate? Anything that's going to happen? And so that went on 
for, I would say, probably six, seven weeks of that intensity uh, where you just like, what was going to happen? And then the New York Times wrote this article about how we were abusing our employees because they talked to someone and the co- you know in the company and we're like and uh, it was a shocking article and uh, which i responded never heard back from them about what we were doing how you're taking one person's story and i said and we know who it is and now she's going to be fired any employee at that time could have been furloughed if you were furloughed or if you um were terminated you got unemployment if you're fired you don't so I said, not only are you, cre- you know, creating this drama, um, and it was, I mean, it was horrific. I saved that letter. So we had that. We had the mayor stuff. We had the sheriffs. So how are you getting through that? But how are you, like, this is the thing. And once again, you got all, it's like, it's amazing. You got New York Times article at that, sheriffs, local politicians, employees, fact, you know, consignment centers, stores. You know, and well, I, so I what, do you, a good, what are you what are you doing to keep it together? I, well, I Rob, but I all right, but together. I do have a good team. I would say there's like three or four things I always do. That yeah, what do you do? Yeah, great. what is your well? I mean, right. one of them is I never stop working out. You know, so I never stop working out. So I'm like, I have to work out, and it has to be intense. I mean, take care it, of your you know, body. Take so, care of your body. Well, it's all, but you have to. I always have to sweat. I can't just do like a little walk and a little talk. You know, I'm like, no, I got to do something hard and cardio. That's number one. Number two. I mean, I have to be honest. There was a lot of wine consumed, and um, I mean, a lot. I, you know, it's not like a bottle a night, but more than you know, it's I'm not like an every night drinker. But you know, there was wine consumed. Um, the other thing is, luckily, as a human, I'm not a germaphobe, all right? So I knew it was serious, but I'm like, okay, I'm not going to wash my vegetable. I mean, I thought things were crazy. If it, So, I mean, that helps because I didn't – it doesn't bug me. That kind of thing but you take. But it sounds like, you're, you're, it sounds like you want to take care of yourself. Like I think what happens to people when they get under the – let's say their first time you've been under the stress before. We'll talk about some of your past, but – it seems like you know that the worst thing you can do to yourself, which is actually sometimes human nature, is abuse yourself. As in, don't work out. I'm tired. I'm, I, and you, you run yourself down instead of keeping yourself strong. It sounds like you just want to maintain something on the physical, mental side. Have a little drink. Get a break mentally. But don't get down is probably where you're going here, right? It sounds like. Even though everyone's, everything's negative. Right. No, it was. Oh, it was so negative. I mean, there was one point. Um, I was just thinking. I can't believe you're talking about this stuff right at the beginning. There was one point when I'm on the phone with the sheriff in Perth Amboy, and he's asking me a question, and I'm like, "Oh my god, I think I'm having a stroke." I mean, I really couldn't see anymore. I couldn't see, and it turned out to be a migraine that just hit, and and migraines affect my vision and my stomach. And my speech. So my speech started getting slurred. I'm like, and I'm like, okay, I don't want him to know that I, this is going on. And I was, and um, anyway, we got off the phone. He promised me he would work with us. And then I sat down and I'm like, okay, am I, it's, it's, do I have to call 911 or am I going to be okay? And it turns out a migraine. I know what to do for migraines, but it was so bad. I mean, that, and it came on so fast. So clearly, it was, you know, affecting me. And clearly it was traumatic. Um, and, but like I said, I have to say, I was, I, w- I because it, I didn't think of the pen, I didn't think I was going to die. I went, you know, I didn't have these other, fe- you know, other people had huge anxiety about their health. It's still, and their- it's still do. Oh, of course. And, yeah. and, and honestly, and, and maybe, maybe I'm, you know, I'm just not that person that thinks they're going to get sick or die. And I very seldom get sick and clearly I didn't die. So, um, so I'm just generally a healthy, I have a great immune system. So I would never was worried for myself. I was worried for how do I make the employees feel safe that are still working? How do I keep running the business despite, you know, really, really horrific lockdown requirements. And actually, I would say disrespectful and kind of unbelievable authoritarian 
action in certain cities and, you know, you give them a little power and, you know, it was pretty scary. And then the other thing, it was clear. Now, this is now May or June, so it's not that far uh, from when we had the initial lockdown. We had to get out of California. We had to get the heck out of California. I don't think those were the words I used. And we were going to, we needed to expand our ops center anyway. And we'd been looking at Texas um, and Arizona and ended up, we had already sort of narrowed it to Phoenix um, and to one center. And we're like, we have to accelerate getting out of California because California is, uh, operating is always, running a business in California is hard anyway. It is not, regardless of whatever the politicians say, it's not a business-friendly state. No one really cares if we're there. You know, they really don't. I mean, I met with all the local officials. I'm like, I'm going to move 500 jobs. And they're like, okay. So, so, so we accelerated that move into Phoenix. That happened still during the COVID time. We got a whole new ops center up and going. COVID time meaning I went on to uh, early 2021 is when we started so now, making that move. So now I have a question for you. It's going to t- now I'm going to take you back a little bit. Where like I know for me the dot well my first company went under that was 92 93 started by person 95 but I had this sleeping on a couch for 2 years starting this company and I learned a lot on that couch and I talk about that on the show but that prepared me for the dot com. Strangely enough, when the dot com happened, I didn't want to go back to the couch. That's why we did these <laughs> massive layoffs. I said, "I'm not sleeping on a couch." And I had at that time, even, when, even though we went public, I had about a hundred grand in my name because the, the, the stock was worthless. We went public and went down to seven cents a share during dot com. So it's not like I had anything. And I thought, "I'm going back to the couch." It prepped me for a future to be here today with the company. What prepped you for now for what just happened here? If you go back in your history, now it could be like something, my childhood, I had some things or pets.com or, you know, Berkeley systems or whatever it is, like what prepared you? Because you're making decisions like this, but something happened in your past, I think. But, you know, all right. So if we go way back. Go all the way. um, I'm I'm going to go way back. Yeah, okay. Go back. I'm the oldest of four kids. And um, when I was eight, my dad was 29. My mother was 21. Uh, we were told my mother was dying and the youngest was four months. And, and it turned out to be not a good diagnosis, but she, and because they said she was dying of encephalitis, she wasn't, um, if she was misdiagnosed, she had multiple sclerosis, which actually turned out to be a horrible, horrible disease. It was a long time ago. It's more manageable now. It wasn't then. And they didn't know a lot about it, but as a kid, I I was told by my father, you're going to have to be the adult here. You're going to have to grow, help take care of the family because your mother isn't going to live. At what age? You're eight years old. Your dad says you're going to have to be the mother, take over. Not be the mother, but you got you're the you're, you're the oldest, so you have a responsibility now. So there's that, which it can't be underestimated. And then, you know, and I think of my father who passed away last year and you think of here, he's 29 years old. He had just started his own business. We have no money. He has four kids The you know, that the last one's four months, his wife's dying. So if you think about that, that's almost surreal. But so anyway, so that happened. And then the other thing, which but I what think, did uh, just did your mother pass away shortly after, or or oh she god, that would have been while? a blessing. No, she. Um, I would say by the time, so she would, so she was twenty eight years old. By the, at thirty six, so she was misdiagnosed, got out of the hospital, took eight years of her having strange things happening. Or doctors, I mean, sadly, they would say, "Oh, it's psychological," you know. Um, uh, the poor thing, she was probably 20 pounds overweight. She probably wore a size six or something. And doctors are saying, no, it's because you haven't lost your baby fat. That's why your hands are, you're, you know, from having a baby, that's why your hands and feet are going numb. And they put her on diet pills because that's what doctors did in the 60s. And, um, and then by the time she was 36, she had another huge uh, episode. And this one... 
Uh, she went blind within 24 hours. She lost her right side collapse. And they're like, oh, she had a stroke. They brought her immediately into the emergency room, ran all these tests. It wasn't a stroke. Did a spinal tap. And they're like, oh, she has MS. She's probably had it for all these other symptoms. And then that was 36. I would say by 47, it had gone to her brain. And um, shortly thereafter, she had to be put in a 24-hour care facility because she couldn't feed her. It was, it was sort of bad. So she couldn't feed herself. She lived to 62, but it was bad because she didn't know who we were. She was like probably 75 pounds of bones and she was scared. And I mean, she had moments, she had moments. We have some funny moments before where she would say things that were, um, if anyone has anyone with Alzheimer's or dementia, you certainly learn, you never tell them they're wrong because it's very frustrating. So you just go with their stories and some of her stories were really fantastic and quite, <laughs> quite enjoyable. And um, but but you had uh, to, but you had to step during that time. You're you're eight, then you're sixteen. You keep, I'm thinking like, did you? So did you? There's the, you, your life, your life radically changed. changed radically, your radically nobody... changed. But I would say also, um, I mean, one of the nice gifts my parents gave me. And I, and I remember this at a very early age, whenever I would ask questions, you know, which, you know, you start asking a lot around two, um, my, my parents would go, oh, you're smart. What do you think? You know, and you're like two, but you know, when you hear that enough, you're, and then you'd have a discussion about it and they would shape the discussion. So it was that whole idea. You're smart. You can figure it out was was already in me from a very early age by both parents. And then I had to figure it out. And also, I think when you're in a household where things don't make sense, like her illness didn't make sense for eight years from eight to 16. And even then, the doctors didn't know a lot about it afterwards. And so you learn to listen between the lines. So, you know, just like I said, what I applied it with, um, with listening to the politicians, I'm like, they have no idea what they're talking about. This is not two weeks. This is going to go on longer. We have to prepare. So, um, you know, all of that's sort of good. I mean, it made me incredibly independent, which always every great thing has its own downsides. As you know, every strength has its weaknesses. So from there, you know, I, oh, I guess I'll ask two questions. One is I often believe there's a, there's a higher hand. I don't know how, whether we call it God or whatever we call it, you know, people, it's energy, but I don't know. Do you think there's this higher hand that's sort of, although you were dealt this deck of cards as a child and, and your family was dealt that you could, you could go like I was dealt, I, I'm being punished, you know, like the, I'm a victim or you look yeah. at it as something else. And then later on, it becomes a strength for you that helps shape you. But do you believe uh, that there's something out there with a hand kind of moving you forward in times like that, or you think like, I just did it on my own, or, you know, where, where do you sit in that world? So, you know, oh, wow. Or, that's, that's, belief? Um, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, I don't, um, here's what I, here's what I know to be true. I know that we're all interconnected that I know I didn't have to microdose on LSD to figure that out. Um, I've had, no, but I've had, um, and I think it's mostly because I was also raised by artists and I have a deep appreciation for the arts and beauty. And I've had highly transcendental moments all through my life where I am, I know this is going to sound really weird, but taken out of my body and I can feel, and I feel like, uh, and it's not necessarily when I'm meditating, I could be just gazing on something beautiful where I feel like I'm, I'm just a molecule. I'm part of the trees. I'm part of the air. I'm part of everything connected. And it's happened enough that I honor it. It's, you know, it's like, I just, and people explain that, you know, they say, Oh, I went on LSD. That's how I experienced that. And I know we're all interconnected. I uh, believe, and you see it no matter what the, the life form is. I think every life form tries to live. I mean, you see it when you're climbing a mountain and you're up at, you know, 8,000, 9,000 feet up and you've got like one green plant trying to live and, and move forward. And so um, I don't know if there's a higher hand. I think you can connect in to something that's bigger than you. And if you listen, um, 
I think you can get a comfort in that. I don't think I do things all on my own. I think of anything um, there's, I, I don't know what it is. I'm not necessarily, I don't believe necessarily in God, but I, but I believe there is a goodness. I believe there's something we don't understand and it directs all living things. And it's pretty amazing. So that's what I believe. I believe, and to be honest, even as, and we didn't grow up and we grew up Methodist. And when you think about, I don't, this is not disrespecting Methodists. This is how I remember my Methodist upbringing. You went to church, you sang some hymns, you did good work. It was sort of like they weren't a guilt place. It was not a place where you had to like, you know, feel bad about your life and, you know, do penance or anything. It was like a place where you sang songs, you did good work, you helped your neighbor, you helped yourself. And, you know, that was sort of the whole thing. Um, And so I had this light touch religion But I mean, there are times when I think inspirations that way, even as a kid, I remember waking up one morning and just feeling the whole room surrounded by light and having a knowingness come in. So So here's because, right. So that's like, that's like a weird uh, anyway, but I would say, yeah, anyway, but I think it's, I know, but I think it's important because I often say like, there are days where you stare into the abyss of whatever you're doing and there's there's nothing back but the i think the hardest thing for entrepreneurs is being alone you're alone it is hard, it is hard. so uh, the reason i brought this up is because even here you are an eight eight year old uh, child and this news is given to you and that's scary and there's if there's a sense that there's something you're connected to it can get you through the abyss i think you know this is what i feel like i always feel there's a hand out there. Once again, I don't know if it's God. I don't have a like, same thing. I'm not super religious on stuff, but I, I felt at times uh, a chill in my body down my spine that I feel like something's there that's going to carry me through a dark day. And so it, it seems like you've been, you've gone through the war. You're a warrior, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and I can't. And so my sense was, did you have this sense of connectivity to something beyond I'm alone in a room and I'm just getting screwed right now. You know, the, the world's after me. Or, no, but yeah. I mean, also, I just think I don't have a victim bone in my body. I mean, you know, there is a little bit. Of Which is important. Genetic. You don't. Have, right. That's let's talk about that. You don't have no. a victim bone. Let's talk about. No. It. Well, no, but I mean, there's if you just I mean, genetically, I was born. I mean, I think I'm I'm sort of an eternal optimist. Just to, I mean, I, like, if you go and you look at you, know, you look at your stuff like in, in um, kindergarten and the teacher writes. It, when she walks in, it's sunshine, but she talks too much. <laughs> you know? So you're like, okay, that hasn't really, the talking too much hasn't changed. But, you know, think about that. So that's like, that's not, that's just who I am as a being. So I think I got lucky that um, I, you know, am basically an optimistic. I wake up and I'm like, this is going to be a good day. That's my first thought. And I always figure like, well, there's a solution here. I mean, I've, you know, clearly it's been shaped from hardship, but um, there always is a solution. And I also firmly believe, and this is really important for entrepreneurs, doing nothing is much worse than doing something. Doing nothing is much worse than doing something. That's a big because one. Because if you do, keep, if keep you, moving, keep moving, move forward. Yeah. Because if you do something, you're going to get instant feedback if you're right or wrong. And taking that first step. So what if you're wrong? Then you correct. You know, so you move forward at all times and you're always thinking, okay, if I, you know, overcorrect it, I'll fix it. Now, when you get a business the size of the real, real, doing something drastic to the business will have immediate devastating effects and you may not be able to come back. But that's a different story um, than where we were in the pandemic. It's a different story when you start a business. Because you, did you, did you, did you kind of build your muscle? Was it at Petstock? When did you build your first business? Like, so you have this child. Oh, right my now. best. I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll tell and you. My, where, where, the it's best not the real, 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 real is recent. No. What was the? Yeah, there was something we had before. That no, was. no. I mean, the experience where it really honed my ability to always figure out the high order bit and set priorities and be very clear was, um, and this is sort of surreal. What I'm going to tell you because I don't know if I would do this, but uh, I left. Uh, I left. I graduated from Purdue. And I got a job at Clorox in brand management, and I was the second undergraduate they ever hired. And I was there three years, and 
got promoted once, was up for a promotion again. And I looked above me and everyone was, uh, they weren't people I necessarily wanted to be. A lot of them were lifers. Most of them were men. There was a woman named Jan Brady uh, who was sort of a rock star there, but then she was going into HR. She wasn't going to go into line management. I'm like, I don't, the, the people above me, I don't want to be. And then this young guy in finance brought in a Mac and um, he started running, boy, this is really going back, but that's okay. He was running VisiCalc, the predecessor yeah, sure. to Lotus. I know you knew that's, that's right, yeah. good. Uh, <laughs> the predecessor to Lotus, which is the predecessor to Excel. He was doing the PL mat work, setting it up and doing it where we were hand calculating our PLs. So think about that. All ingredients, doing what ifs, what ifs by hand. You'd have a room like an eight by 20 room fill of, of what ifs, you know, one scenario, one scenario. And um, once I saw that, I'm like, oh my God, this is the future. So I get called to my boss at Clorox, which was a great guy named um, Tom Lefevre, left the company. And he went to work eventually with um, Scott Cook at Intuit as one of the founders of Intuit. But he took us a step uh, into a company called Velobind. He asked me to go. I said, no, I didn't want to work in a book binding company. I joined a company called Software Publishing where his wife was. She was like, okay, Julie's fair game now. I want her in this company. And at the age of, I think I was 25 years old, I moved to London to set up the international office. Now I had a boss uh, the head of sales moved over there. They, he moved into international. He ended up getting fired within nine months. So I moved to London. I didn't know a soul. My territory was anything outside of the U.S. And but we were going to work through partnerships and um, to to actually internationalize the products because they all had to be localized. And my job was to set, find the partners, set it up, and then manage the partners. So during that time, I'm alone in London. I don't know anyone. The boss was fired, and my ter- and so. What happened? And I we'd already started setting up partnerships, and that experience allowed me to focus on. I you know I wanted to succeed. I wanted to get that revenue up. I wanted to get the right partnership, and I had free reign because to be honest, no one cared about international. They're like, oh, maybe she can get some international business over there. And um, I was in. Uh, I had I set up partnerships in Paris, Barcelona, Milan, Munich. Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Sao Paulo, and actually even Canada, because we had to localize it for the French, the French speaking people there. And literally, I was traveling 85% of the time, meeting with everyone. Now, can you, like, I'm 25, 26 years old. It's pretty crazy. And that honed my thinking skills. Well, Clorox was great at honing your thinking skills because you have to write. Everything moves by memo. When you write everything down, you have to be concise and persuasive in your documents. And every no, there couldn't be a document more than two pages. So it really was, you know, just the facts, support the facts, tell me, give me, you know, what's your recommendation? Give me your basis for recommendation. Give me any data you had then. Boom, boom, boom. So the writing for three years and the working on the writing and moving everything forward with a written document shapes your thoughts. Then applying it, in an international field where you don't have structure. I had no structure. So I had to set up the own structure and to get the deals done. And I think I got it up to about a hundred million before I moved back. I went back for another time in London, 90 to 93. And during that time, doing the same thing for another company. And um, that was an offshoot of software publishing. So I honed my um, execution skills to keep the high order bid. Clorox helped me hone my thinking skills to make sure that I was always focusing on the right thing. And uh, when I came back, I was a transformed executive. There was absolutely no doubt in my mind. And, you know, clearly, um, uh, you know, you, when you're going into foreign countries doing business, you get other soft skills that you're not even aware of. All the cultural side of it. So you got right. all the cultural side. So tell yeah. me, you, you recently, you know, there was some, I'll ask you to explain. You left, you're leaving, or you've, you've left the real well, world. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sort of I, a long goodbye. You're, really yeah, you're out, right. The, uh, right. So I'm, I'm, out, I'm out, though. I'm out. Operationally, I'm out. Right. And there's like co-CEOs now, or there's, from my understanding, and um, 
you're actually a customer of ours, so I, I, know, I know this we work with you guys. But, okay. Okay. but um, uh, was that your decision? Was that I know there's a lot of pressure on share share stuff. The stocks that were all down, like the whole world's very the pressure on the stock market is extreme. Well, I mean, like, I always uh, said, or, we where, gotta, where did it come out? Where did, yeah, where did we got We have a new CFO, um, and I always said to him, "Look, look, if I if I'm damaging the company, let me know. I'll leave." But here's here's the truth. Um, about a year ago, so first of all, COVID was hard, you know, really hard. But about a year ago, when things started lifting, I um, started looking at another category and another business because Real Real is now in a time where it's all about efficiency and process and process refinement. And um, I started working on a whole new category, whole new business idea. And testing what was already in the market to see, can you build something better? Is there a better solution? Um, And in January of this year, I consolidated all my direct reports under Rossi Levac, who's co-CEO. And um, I was planning on leaving at the end of the year, and I'm leaving at the end of the year. So, um, and and I'm out starting another company, and I'm really excited about it. And part, and there's so many reasons why. But I would say, first of all, I want to play to my strengths, which is really, you know, creating, getting something product market fit, getting it to market. Um, I think this will have a bigger impact than the real rail. I think it's going to be, has the potential to impact a lot more lives in a positive way. And I'm, you know, 65, I'm old. So if you look at that and you're like, how many years? I think I've got 20 good years of which five, I really want to work hard still. And, um, you know, time is a, this is the beauty about being over 60. You're, you're, you're highly cognizant that, you know, you of time. And then you look ahead of you and you're like, well, I hopefully I won't be like, um, I think our starting with the end of the, I'm the tail end of the boomers almost. So the boomers, the tail end of the boomers. I, I never was into drugs. You know, I never did anything that radical. But we were, but even the boomers, which people don't give us credit for, we were into the environment. We just didn't know what to do with it. Certainly we were into equal rights because it started in the 60s and women's rights. So, you know, it's a conscious group that, um, you know, and I'm in great health, but I look ahead of me and I don't know if I have a roadmap for how I'm going to age because I'm not aging like the people in front of me. But I do know by doing specific things that I can stay really healthy and get this business done. And the business is in health tech. So okay. I'm going to help a lot more people on a broader level. So um, so I'd say age is a great thing when you're, you know, I, obviously you never know when you're going to go. But you know right. pretty well, but you know pretty well that, you know, you're, you're not going to live to 110 <laughs> when, you're, right. when you're 65. And uh, so I want to make the most out of it. And I like. Was it hard? Like, was it hard to let go of what you have? Or it's you, still hard. It, it's, it's your baby. Hard. It's your baby. Yeah. It, it's like it's. It's still from, hard. It, it's the create. You create something from nothing. You made it right. a success, and to just say, "Oh yeah, I got another thing. I'm walking, uh, ready." To, um, and I found a good successor, or you know, you're saying like I found someone who can potentially run run the show. Than me. Yeah, better than me at that. Um, I would say it is. Someone asked me that yesterday and I started crying. So yes, it's hard. It's really hard. And I'm going to be going to see employees on um, next week um, on the East Coast and thanking them for all their work. And I think it's going to be, it's gut-wrenching. But I do know, I mean, most of the, women, most of the people in the company are women. Um, it's a very diverse company. Um, it's, a very, it's always been an a company I think that actually tried to be and and continues to be as accepting as possible of all of everyone, and um, a creative company, an analytic company, and the employees are really amazing. So it's going to be really hard. It's the people. It's not leaving what I built. It's the people that are amazing that I may not see again. Some of them I will, I'm sure, but most a lot of them I won't. And it was, I mean, I view it as like, it's been, I mean, you're going to make me cry, uh, but it was, it's been an honor. It's been an honor to work with this team. And, um, you know, that's the hard part. And so, 
Yeah, it's but the why, hard part. What's the emotional connection about? I mean, you know, like some people, it's, they, it's a job, like, but you just, you kind of stopped there well, for a second. Because, I looked in your you eyes. Know, I, I, I could know. tell you had, that, like, you're saying, like, the company is the company, but it's the people that are behind it. And somehow there's something there. You know, what, what is that? Well, I would yeah. say, you know, when you, um, uh, when you set out a vision and you have an idea of how a company is going to go and you set that vision out and you hire good people and they execute and take it beyond your wildest dreams and they create something because um, the, my management style is to hire good people and let them do their thing, uh, set the direction. And they create something that um, all the, everything that happens was actually laid out, including the look and feel of the site. I mean, all before. So there was a roadmap because, and it's all based in um, cons- being a consumer marketer, but then they do things that you're like, wow, I never, I mean, that's just amazing. And um, the the guy that runs the AI, unbelievable what he's been able to do as a data scientist. The people in the op centers and what they do every day and how they authenticate. And the other thing is, you know, you walk in and they're like young people and I'm in our op center, these people are dressed and they're making it happen. And they really believe in the mission, which is important that we want to keep goods out of landfills and it's really important. So they believe in the mission. They look amazing. They're, you know, they're dynamic, creative, mission driven people that have executed better at collectively. It's a complete uh, it's a company that is a collaborative company, but they collaborate there. They're, in fact, I would say every employee that really gets into the collaboration because it's multifunctional collaboration, they're doing something they couldn't do alone. And the company's bigger because everyone collaborates. And so that, that, that setting that up is that that's the way we work in the company. It's not, it wasn't hierarchical, hierarchical. It was, you know, collaborative things come out of it that are better than any one person could do. And it's, and it's been a, a, it's been a phenomenon for me to watch them. It's been a joy. It's been, um, it, it's been an honor for me to be able to run the company and see this idea that come to life in a way that transcends what one person could do. So it seems like what you're saying, and, and is that part of your role, of being an entrepreneur and a leader of the businesses is, is the ability to bring people around an idea. Like you're the, you know, it, it sounds obvious. I'm just stating the obvious, but people need to understand it's not you're driving individuals. You're like, you got this idea, it exists in the ether of an idea. Then it gets somehow sketched on a piece of paper, as we know. Then it gets, but you, you're not coding it. You're not doing all the work. You're not doing all the design. You didn't build the warehouse. You got to go get a group of people who are going to be around your energy and your vision. And be excited about that somehow. That's not easy. That's not easy. No, but I mean, but no, but I had very. No, it's not easy, and I made a lot of mistakes in hiring. I would say that's my biggest regret. You know how they always say that, you know, you never, you never feel bad when you finally fire that person. You should have let go, and and there were different reasons. I would say. Uh, I made, I mean, I made some mistakes. The op center, the, the interesting thing about all these new business, especially the real rail, you want skilled executives who understand the space, but you want them to still be an active problem solver. You don't want them to be a plug and play person. And when you go to most established businesses and even businesses that are like um, something like Macy's and you're. Um, you know, they understand that they've been fulfilling stories for a long time. So you bring people that have an idea of how the business works and then, but they have to unlearn it at the real, real, if they bring those skills without changing them about 30 to 40% and being open to new ways, they will fail. And because they're not, they're, they're traditional thinkers, but they're not creative problem solvers and the real, real doesn't create any products. We take in products, you know, eight, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand products a month, process those products, and it's a different way of thinking. Uh, same thing with the retail store, different way of thinking. And I would say finding that exec that is still 
learning. They're not bureaucratic. They want to apply new tools. They're te- they have a technology underpinning, but they deep in their area has always been a problem. And then the other issue is, you know, you want people to challenge you as a CEO, but you want them to ultimately align and be on your team. And if you have one executive that isn't, uh, and that person can do a lot of damage. And I, you know, I've had that in the past and it's been someone, you know, someone where you're like, they're not that good. I really should let them go. And they're not helping. They're working against me and other execs. Um, And then things happen like, you know, COVID happens. You're like, well, am I going to fire them now? You know, and you're like, I don't think so. Cause we got, you know what I mean? So there's, yeah. There's events that happen that way. But you um, know deep down, but you know deep down, I, I've had this, I actually had it recently, uh, you know, you know deep down that they're not going to help the business. I think what you said, I, I want to bring out something really interesting. I think great leaders are brought in to transform a business, to transform a, a, a part of the business. They're not built in, they're not just there to manage an existing system. If they're exactly. leaders, they, exactly. that's what you find sometimes. If the companies, big companies, they plugged into a system and they're magic, but they come to you where you're more dynamic, you're growing, you're expecting to change the system, expand it, right? You know, innovate it, not take, take right, take, take what they know and go beyond that. Yes. And they, that's where they there's a gap because there's some people who just that's not their job is just managing a system they're given. Uh, it's hard to find that, I think, for a business and a scale. Growth. Wait, and also a growth business because you think about you're pulling, especially us, because we pulled from traditional retail. Retail retail is really hasn't grown forever. You know, think about it. It's like a 5% growth. And they're like, Oh, this is a good year. COVID was different with they had an e-commerce, but you know, maybe they're growing 10%. Well, when you're growing 30 to 40%, which we were before COVID and then it picked back up. And now I think it's, I, I mean, we'll see what they come out with recently, but when I left, it was up still over 25, 30%. Um, and, it's a different mindset. And so there's a growth mindset. The real world isn't, is, is like an e-commerce business, but it's not. Uh, also, it's still a roll up your sleeves business. So you get execs in who like, I don't want to do that. I've had, you know, 15 years of experience and you're like, oh, wow. Um, and then the workforce is diverse. So that's the other thing. You don't have you know, again, mostly women. I would say the, the the profile is mostly women and mostly non-white. Now, um, so you look at that, and who who is running that kind of company? We just still creating. So it's really an interesting challenge, I have to say. Hmm. It's a so, good one. Um, it's a good one. But when you get someone that knows it, I mean, then miracles happen. That's what I said. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Then, you get, then like the you cool get things that, you get. Right, get that right person. It's like boop, and they they, they get yeah. right on that continuum of growth mindset it's, and operational take, excellence. Yeah, right. That's it, and that's a hard intersection. I would say, I always tell people it takes six to nine months, and even people that say, "Oh no, I'm you know I've come in and like," they the later on they'll go, "You're right. It took six to nine months." It's like I you know because the business isn't like where they. I don't care where they came from. It is not that. It is that, but it's not that. Exactly, it's a it's a new creation. That's how I look at it. Right. Like it's a new new creative endeavor. So I have we're coming to the top of the hour, and I, I always like to ask this question, which is, uh, you know, and I, I ask it to everyone. You can hopefully you'll give me an honest response. I, I would say we all have this gremlin in our head that I think a lot of us are fighting. We wake up in the morning, and it's there's something in our there's a voice that's there, and um, do, what's your voice? in your head. Well, you know, here's the interesting thing. I, how many females have you had on this show? A fair amount, a fair amount. Have yeah, you? Lisa, I don't Lisa know Bilo, if anyone yeah. have talked about it, but. And Lisa Below told me, she told me that one of her things was that I'm stupid. I'm stupid she, because she would be in meetings with men, she said, and she'd walk in and hear them like, so this is what she said, because then I'm not stupid, but she would hear like, I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough to be in this. And so she, this is one oh, thing yeah. said well, being I a never woman. Had that. Yeah, okay. No, I, I never say. had that. No, no, no. I never had that. Remember, my parents were like, "You're exactly. You're, too. you're exactly, smart. Yeah. You can figure it you're out." Smart. Exactly. So yeah. I never had that. But I would say, um, you know, 
one of the challenges as um, when with women, and I think more so than men, you're still, uh, and people always write about my age, they write about me, uh, people have commented on my looks and articles. And I would say, um, you know, from a, and uh, from a very early age, you learn that like how you look like trans people react to how you look like. And I would say at, at you know, so if uh, I've always been conscious of that and trying to gain credibility. And I can tell you, um, one of my bosses uh, early on told me, this is really a, t and it was a woman and it was a terrible thing to tell anyone. And I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I said to this person even then. Um, and, and you can, you may have to edit it because it's a four letter word, but she said, um, you're too pretty to be in business. All right. And, um, and I was really young. I was in my twenties and, um, and it affects people around you. That's what she said. And I said, now you, you can imagine in today. So this is the eighties. That person would have like had a loss. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But. But it was the 80s. I mean, there wasn't even a sexual harassment. But this is a woman. Policy. This is a woman who said this to you, not a man. You're saying. Yeah, oh, a woman. A woman. So and, um, and I said, F you, blank. Prove it to me. Prove me that my result, I'm not getting better results. You tell use inform, you prove it. And she couldn't because my results were good. So this was about her. But can you right. imagine a young? So I would say, what do I think about every day? I think about. Did you? Did she fire you or quit? Or you're like, just, no, she just ended like, up getting it... fired. No, okay. I wasn't gonna. No, I was like. No, I was gonna say. No, but she just, tried. No, she she won. I mean, but what a nasty thing to say. And even is. if I would have talked to HR, they would have been like, really? So what? You know? I mean, look, men were at Clorox. So back in the '80s, it would be like. So I just, who cares? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, buck up, baby. You know, you know, get on yeah. with it. But I basically, you know, said to my boss, F you, prove it. And, um, and anyway, I'm not, I wouldn't highly, I would not recommend that for a new employee starting. I would say, show me the data though. I mean, I don't know if I would use uh, the F word like I did, but I would say that um, every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, you know, you can't, you know, you don't want to age like a freak, but what can I do? <laughs> Cause you just, I'm a visual person. It's not like I'm, I always say to someone like, I'm not, it's not like tomorrow I'm going to be younger. It's not like I'm going to be better looking tomorrow. It's like those days are gone. <laughs> so it's trying to figure out, I would say I'm I'll, just because I grew up, I was in the eighties. I'm one of the only women execs that stuck it out. And I've had a lot of sexism, a lot of it around being, you know, five foot two, blonde. Um, uh, anyway, so, I mean, it's always been interesting and it's always been a challenge. I'll tell you another funny thing, and it started in high school. So I was homecoming queen. I, in my sophomore year, and this and this uh, this student who I loved, his name was Stuart, and I talked and I subsequently talked to him. He's a judge now in Chicago. Stuart's like Julie, don't let it go to your head. You're pretty, but you're not beautiful. So like, keep studying. I swear to God. <laughs> and so I'll never. And I, he said, I said that when I was horrible. I said actually, I thought it was sort of good advice. <laughs> Isn't that funny? But so I would say that women have other pressures that men don't have as exact. You have to worry about how you look physically. You have to worry about, am I did this in my thirties and forties? Are you going to have a child? How are you going to navigate that? You have to worry about, um, you just have a lot of, you know, you have to worry about your, your parents aging. In my case, I had to worry about my siblings and then my parents. And then you just, you know, it's a different burden. I can tell you that I don't know many men that get up and think, oh, my God, I look worse today than I did yesterday. So if you want to know what I'm in my head, I'm like, oh, God, aging. And then part of me is like, oh, screw it. I'm healthy. But all, yeah. of, but I would say I've had to be conscious because um, I've had to be conscious of, of what I wear and what I look like because people notice it and comment it and they still are. And it's sort of, you know, at some point. 
they always talk about women being get there's a there's a freeing thing I think when women get older because you do become somewhat invisible, but not as a CEO. They're still commenting on it, you know, and um, you know it is freeing not to think oh you know I'm getting you know but when I was younger I had all kinds of weird stuff happen to me, like I had you know. Not anyway, I had weird people follow me around, leaving notes, really treacherous things, and um, and treacherous things when I was overseas. You know, because remember, I was on planes, going to this, going to that. Right. Not not a lot, but all you need is a couple to sort of wake you up and uh, recognize that the world that men maneuver in is in the world of. I don't have any, no. I mean, I always think about safety when I go out. You know, so um, always. And when I was traveling, I always thought about safety. I mean, women have to think about safety. You have to. And, you know, as a person who was in an image company, I have to think about how I look. And I've been like, I think about it all the time. Also, my parents are artists, so I'm also visually trained. So visually, I've always been attuned to, um, you know, anything, any kind of beauty, any kind of, you know, interesting things but yeah that's what's in my head it's not that i'm stupid in fact if anything you know i probably think i'm smarter than i am but it doesn't matter it's been proven so i don't have that issue um that other women may i have no i've never had a problem speaking up you know again kindergarten highly talkative um and uh but there's always something it's just we have a different set we have a different set i can tell you um, and I'm single again. When you're dating people, I don't know many men think about. I mean, the men I'm dating are like they think they're great. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's just different. It's just different. I can. I mean, they're really funny stories, and I kind of love that. And I'm like, okay, well, there you go. There you go. You think you're great? Okay, <laughs> you're not so fabulous, but oh, that's okay. No, you know what I mean. It's like, and you know, you always say, "Oh, you know, you want to." It's not about the way you look, but in some degree, it is. Yeah. I don't care how old you are. I mean, you just don't. You know, people still like Judge to look at things. Yeah, yeah of course. Like that, at, you know, that you pretty don't things want are. To. You don't yeah. want to, but you do. So I, uh, well, I could stay on for another couple hours with you, but because uh, I, for, and you're a wonderful. So Rob, you just really life. dig, you just <laughs> dig in there, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah because, uh, you know, I, like I said, uh, you've been a great guest, by the way, because it's like you've had this journey. I go back to it. A lot of times what we read about, you know this, and we, especially in social media with all those, I uh, call them motivational speakers who have a company of two. It's them and their assistant. And they're talking about, I got a private jet and I hey, get up and uh, just make it work. Go sell, and you know, you and I, we run companies with people. We had to create ideas <laughs> that exist that yes. didn't exist to get a bunch of people excited about nothing. And you're going to take exactly. nothing, get it to something, sell it, and we're all getting. And you got to keep up. And so it's what I think people tend to see so mostly is like it's easy. All you have to do is get out of bed and wake up at four o'clock in the morning, and 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 what you see is it's a complex life. And what I always find is that people have these interesting childhoods that I think prepare them for things, which for some people could be crippling. And some people would look, I had this childhood, my mom say, and I look, that's, I, I just, I, I had a burden. And, and, and yet I find a lot of people are successful. They turned it into something. Now it, it looked like a gift. It's not a gift that someone got sick or something, but it's a gift in that it prepared me to be where I am today at 65. Absolutely. You're here because, but if you look back at the girl from eight years, when she's eight years old, you know, go back on that continuum it's like you were faced with something that you can never imagine it could get you to where you are at 65 uh, you know yeah i mean i you know i can't imagine there's so many things i can't imagine like a little eight-year-old dealing with and i don't think parents you know parent my dad's another generation where you buck up you know so yeah. you're just talking to me like an adult but i was eight you know <laughs> so you know it's um luckily he started talking to me like i was an adult when i was two so it did help. Yeah. <laughs> I got to start that. I have a, I have a six year old daughter, so I've got to, I'll start by, uh, you know, and I try to, obviously I, I have, I admire her. You know, you can't help it as, as daddy's uh, girl. You know, I want her to be the strongest woman that she could be. You know, you want them to go out in the world and, and uh, be able to face adversity and grow and be somebody like yourself. Right. And you right. are a, a beacon for my daughter. 
and I uh, and, and, and 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 entrepreneurs like myself. But but I there I look at what you've done, and my daughter will look up to people, and uh, hopefully she'll uh, listen to this when she gets older and see like I you know I can have this life like this woman created, and uh, and built all these wonderful things that the world shares in all these creative ideas like the real world. So. I appreciate uh, what you put into the world and the hard work you've done in running a public company and moving on and getting something new going up. And I look forward to uh, seeing what you're doing in the health space. It's probably pretty cool oh. stuff. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. You're really going to make me cry here in the end. But thank you. I appreciate everything you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And I'm really day. tearing up here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.